Mm -hmm. We're being recorded too. Yeah. Um, yeah. How's that? There you go. Good. On my screen, I'm seeing Gurtez saying K. And that's the main thing I'm seeing. And that might make sense because we're only going to see one person at a time. So why am I just seeing a teeny picture of me? The person who's speaking uh, should be getting the screen. Oh, I said gallery view. That's not really what we bargained for. Text, indeed. No. You don't think you're co-host anymore. Well, we have 39 participants. God bless you all if you're seeing this. We're just sorting out the, the bugs here. Um, well, I could. Um, uh, all right. <laughs> um, I think. Um, I know, I'm gonna click my own picture, that might help. There we go. So I'm, I hope everybody can see me now reasonably well, fix my turban here. Um, Gritez, you see me okay? Yeah. Okay, and uh, Amit, how's it going there, Amit? Did you lose Amit? Um, all right, well, let's, let's everybody, um, begin. Let's, uh, put our hands together. We'll do Adgare Nameh three times and we'll go from there. Adgare Nameh, Shiva Adgare Nameh, Satgare Nameh, Siri Gurudeva Nameh, Adgare Nameh, Shiva Adgare Nameh. Satgare Nameh, Siri Gurudeva Nameh, Adgare Nameh, Jigadgare Nameh, Satgare Nameh, Siri Gurudeva Nameh. Why did you call it Sawaj Fateh? Welcome everybody. Uh, this is my first webinar, can you tell? Um, I, I uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, I'm very grateful to our uh, co-panelist, Gurudeva Singh, who's a uh, joining us from Singapore, where it's just past midnight. And uh, I think we've got Amit uh, helping us with the technical details. And uh, I'm very grateful to you all. The reason we're doing this is um, I, um, I want to get out the other stories from the, the negative stories we've been hearing about uh, Yogi Bhajan. And there just hasn't been a big, uh, hasn't been any forum for that. So um, I was very lucky that uh, Gurtej Singh uh, agreed to join us even this awkward hour and um, and so we put out the invitations to you all and and welcome aboard this is all being recorded if somebody misses it uh, they can um, if all the technology works uh, they should be able to experience it uh, later on I'm also grateful to um, folks who were signed on for this webinar and the one on Tuesday and I told them we're kind of crowded um, if you can uh, uh, pull back from this one uh, give your space to somebody who uh, isn't in either, and uh, a number of people have done that, so I'm grateful. Um, so thank you all, and um, Gurtej, we'd like to speak. Satnam, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to us and to participate with this. Um, it, you know, in in a time like this, when there are so many questions and so many issues. Uh, I don't want to get into um, any kind of, you know, defense of City Singh Saad or accusations or anything like that. That's not the objective here. The objective is simply to talk about his life and what he accomplished. Um, and the, the positive things that he accomplished. And, you know, if people have issues and 
felt that they were harmed by him, that's a different matter. And uh, sorry, I, I can't share my video because it's after midnight here and I'm in the dark. So even if my if my video was on, you wouldn't be able to see me. So Oh um, that explains it. Yeah, it's um because people are sleeping and I actually had to come outside. I'm I'm sitting outside. Um and it's you know after midnight and it's quite dark so the point was to have my camera on <laughs> okay carry on now i understand so you know the point is um many people have have talked about uh the adverse experiences they've they've had with city sink sadhguru bhajan and i just like to talk about my life with him because i was uh, I was really rather close with him. Some of you may know I was um, I was a personal aide to him. I was his bodyguard. I traveled the world with him. Uh, I'm also the founder of a call security, which um, he took a very special interest in and was was actually deeply involved with a call security and. Um, he, he called on me, actually pulled me out of a call a number of times to do things uh, for him and for the, for the Dharma. I mean, he sent me to Europe. He sent me to India. He, he had, me, had me go out and travel a lot and, and do things on his behalf. And in fact, uh, there were times when we were on tour and he was supposed to teach and had some conflict and, and several times he, he sent me to teach in his place. I'm the only man who ever did his night duty. Uh, his night duty was always something very sacred and special and I was, I was honored to do that, which meant that it, it was my responsibility to help him go to bed. He only slept between two and a half and three hours a, a night. So he didn't sleep very long, but during the time that he was sleeping, it was necessary to be awake. It was necessary to, to make sure that the music played continuously and then to help him get up in the morning. Morning, I mean, he would get up obviously very early. Um, I would help him get dressed, have a shower and all of that. And, um, you know, so I, I, I was very close with him. And being his, um, his primary bodyguard, uh, especially when we were on tour, I slept outside of his door um, many, many nights. And um, so I, I also had the opportunity to learn from him directly. Um, he taught me a number of very sacred kriyas that... Um, he didn't teach in his regular classes. Not that they were secret, um, and you know, I never thought of them as secret kriyas that he was only teaching to me, but he taught them to me personally and told me it was my responsibility to teach those. And, and I, I have done that. But you know, I was, I was really fortunate to have learned from him in that way and to learn that technology. I'll always be grateful that he, he brought me to the feet of the guru and that that experience and the experience of learning directly from him was, was very transformative. And, you know, I, I always felt that whatever he did, um, was was genuine and was sincerely in the best interests of his students. Um, I remember in, I think it was winter solstice of 1972 or 73, when we were in that funky little trailer park in Orlando, if anyone was there and remembers that far back. And he talked about 
himself as um uh, what was that what's that message Let's see what it says Well, I apologize that I do not inspire you, but I, there's nothing I can do about that um, because you you I, you can't see me. I mean, it's just the way it is because I'm in the dark. Um. Anyway, um. You know, I I was just very fortunate to have learned from him, and and he talked about himself as a Saturn teacher. And he, he explained what being a Saturn teacher is. And, you know, he learned his teacher was very harsh with him. And the way he taught was not quite as severe as the way Santa Zada Singh, his, his teacher was. But it was, it was in that spirit and it was in, in that tradition. And certainly he was... You know, he he was like that with me. I mean, he was he was very um, very direct and very blunt, and at times even harsh with me. Um, and I appreciated it. Now, at the at that time, not necessarily. Um, but as I matured and absorbed what he what he taught. I'm really grateful for that and for that experience with him. One thing about him that really sticks out with me is that he was never not a teacher. And in public, meeting with the public, going to a movie, going to a restaurant, Wherever he was, wherever he interacted with people, he was always as a as a teacher and always would do something to elevate and uplift that person in some way. And um, I, that was that really struck me because I, I he was always at least every time that I was was around him always acted that way and acted as a teacher um did what he felt was in the best interest of of the students who were there now i understand that there are allegations and i'm not here to to confirm or dispute those i'm just here to tell you what my experience was with him and the how i knew him and how how i perceived him and experienced him as a teacher because i never thought of him as anything other than a teacher i didn't <clears throat> i really i didn't want to be his pal i didn't want to be his buddy um i i never thought of myself as as his equal even when he sent me to teach in his place i always considered him as a teacher and that that his his way of speaking to me his way of of interacting with me his way of of teaching me was strong and powerful but i always felt it was in my own best interest um you know, he, he used to say, what is the relationship between a chisel and a stone? Because he, he used the analogy that the teacher was the chisel. And the student was the stone. And the answer is the spark. When the chisel gets hammered against the stone, it creates a spark. And he talked about that, that it's that spark, that spark that the teacher chisels out of the student that brings the enlightenment, that brings the awareness, that brings the experience of consciousness. And he was all about the experience. He was all about 
that we as his students should have our own experience of consciousness. He was not about people depending on his personality or, you know, Yogi G said this, Yogi G said that. He said a lot of things. And he said a lot of things to different people. And he said many, I, 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 I remember talking to people who were in the same lecture that I was in, the same class, and, and everybody heard what he said differently because he was speaking to each of us individually in his capacity as a teacher. Now, I was trained as a policeman and I, I was a, an, I'm a trained investigator. And one of the things that they told us is people hear things differently, they perceive things differently. For everyone, it's different. And we can all be in the same room. We can all be in the same environment. We can all be watching the same movie. And we all have different impressions, different, it has a different effect and impact on us, depending on our background, between, depending on our, our uh, experiences in life, on our desires and our longings and all of that. So, you know, it's always, it was always like that, it was always different. And I remember, I mean, now, he used to say, you can't live with me and you can't live without me. And, you know, for the people who were around him and who were close with him, those were the people that he was really the, the hardest on. And I don't know how many times I, I would get called into the dome or called to the ranch or to Dr. Allen's in LA, where he would just unload on me. And, you know, it, you know, I remember when very early on in my life, actually before I met him, I was reading some book on on spirituality or something and um i remember reading something that says god will never give us tests that are too much for us that whatever it is you can get through it but we always get tested to the limit and that's that's what a teacher does a teacher is supposed to test the students a teacher is supposed to push the students. And, you know, he, he always wanted to push us out of our comfort zones so that we could grow. And he, he frequently said, you know, if I don't push you, if I don't hammer you, if I don't chisel you, you can't grow because it's the reaction to that pressure that brings out your greatness, that brings out your divinity, that brings out your radiance. And, you know, he used the, used the analogy of, of a stone, of, of a precious stone, like a diamond or a ruby, where it's just a piece of rock when it comes out of the ground. But somebody who knows what they're looking at recognizes that this is a precious stone. Then it has to be cut out of the rock. Then it has to be cut and chiseled to its shape. Then it has to be held to, to a wheel that is very, very um, uh, abrasive to polish it, to polish that stone so that when the light shines through it, it refracts that light and brings out the full energy of the stone. And that's what he always said he, he was trying to do with us. And, you know, I mean, I, I had experiences with him where he was, he was very you know, hard on me because, you know, someone once asked him, 
why do you always yell at your cage, but you never yell at me? And he said, some people I see with my eyes. Some people I look at through a magnifying glass. Some people I have under a microscope. I look at you with my eyes, but the cage is under the microscope. And, you know, I've, <laughs> I kind of remained under the microscope for a long time. Um, but, you know, I've got no, I've got no regrets because it, it made me who I am. And it, you know, it, it gave me a perspective and I think a strength that I otherwise wouldn't have. I remember, um, well, I'll tell you, and uh, some of you may have read um, um, Pamela Premka's book. Now, I haven't read the book, to be honest, but somebody sent me a chapter because she put a chapter in there about my daughter, not Jew and Cor. Um, my daughter died when she was seven and a half. And it was, it was uh, just kind of a freak accident that I always felt was between her and God, her and the group. Um, and in the book, uh, there's a lot of misinformation. It, it's uh, presented in a way that, you know, is not... Uh, not favorable to me as her father. But when she died, when that happened, Yogiji called me up. And all he said was, Gurdage, you son of a gun, chat a call for the next 17 days. Everything is good. And I did. And everything was good. I mean, you know, as a parent, and I would guess that many of you are are parents yourselves, and you know, nothing nothing is more frightening, I guess, to a parent than the thought of losing a child. <clears throat> I don't recommend it for anybody. But going through it and going through it with his words made all the two two things really made a huge difference for me one was city sing side and and his guidance and all of that and the other was the sangat now i was i lived in espanola at that time i now live in singapore but i, I lived in espanola for about 40 years and I'm not talking only about the Espanola Sangha, but, you know, the entire global Sangha, because I heard from so many people. And she died just a few weeks before summer solstice in uh, 1981. So at summer solstice, so many people came to me and, you know, just, just that presence, just their kindness, just their blessings made such a huge difference. Um, and, you know, City Singh Sahib talked about that. I mean, he, you know, he brought me to Guru's feet. He brought me, you know, taught me about the power of Sangat. And I had the experience of that myself in a very significant first-hand way. So, you know, his, his, you know, he, he, he had a, a pretty blunt way of talking to some people and, and he always was very blunt with me. Um, we used to joke that because Yogi always said he never initiated anybody because this is a path of self-initiation. And I remember joking with with uh, one of my friends um, 
that, well, <clears throat> you're really initiated by him when he calls you a motherfucker. <laughs> so he could, he could be very direct, he could be very blunt, and he could be very harsh. But it was always to make us grow. It was always to elevate us. You know, and, and being in the position that I was in, I was responsible for his cars and his motorcycle and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, there were times when he want, would want something done and he was never satisfied with it. And I always remember the story of Vajeta when Guru, Guru Amardas wanted him to build the, the platform for him to sit on. And seven times Vajeta built that platform and Guru was never satisfied with it until Jatha humbled himself before the Guru because it was, it was, it was a demonstration between Vajeta and Rama. Both were the sons-in-law of the Guru. Vajeta was married to Ivivani, who was one daughter, and Rama was married to Dani, who was the other daughter of, of Guru Amrit Guru Amr Das. And people, some people thought that because Guru Amr Das was, was quite old, and many people were wondering who would who would be the next Guru, and some thought that Rama was was the most fit for Guru, and some thought that Jetha was. And now, by by Jetha always did whatever Guru Amr Das wanted him to do. Um, he served the longer, so he didn't really have like a day job he was always doing seva and that sort of thing rama was a bit more um worldly not he, he was not a bad man i'm not implying that but he was he he had a job he he took very good care of his family and both thought both were considered to be very fit for the guruship and the question was who would it be and people were trying to influence Guru Amar Das. You know, you should make you should make Rama the, the next Guru. Or you should make Vajeth the next Guru. So he gave them both the task to build a dais, a platform, right by the the entrance to the Bali, which is if you've been to Gondwal, you know, you go down the eighty four steps to the water. Um, that that was built, and both Vajeth and Rama were put a lot of time, back-breaking work into digging that and, and creating it. So he had them both, he said, build one by Jetha on one side of the door, Rama on the other side, and whichever one I like the best, I'll sit on in the morning, and the other one I'll sit on in the evening. And every day he would come down in, in the evening to inspect the work, and for both of them, he was never satisfied with it. After the fourth day, Rama said, I'm not doing this anymore. You can't be pleased, you're just an old man. And he picked up his stuff and he left. He had a lot of remorse and he begged the Guru's forgiveness, but he never went back to work on the platforms. But Jatha continued, and after he built the seventh platform, Guru Amar Das was still not pleased with it. And by Jatha fell at Guru's feet and begged his forgiveness. And he said, please show me, please show me. And Guru then had him stand up and said, seven times you've built this platform for seven generations, you're your next seven generations will sit on it. And from, from the time of Guru Ramdas, because he made by Jatha Ramdas, Guru Ramdas, um, the son of Guru Ramdas was Guru Arjun, the son of Guru Arjun was Guru Hargobin, um, the grandson of Guru Hargobin was Guru, um, the, the grandson of Guru Hargobin was Guru Harai, and on and on and on until Guru Gobind Singh. So 
that tradition still continues, but it, it shows my point in telling that story is it shows the tradition and kind of how how a classical teacher in that tradition and a Saturn teacher as, as Guru Amar Das was as well would would treat their students, you know, and and by Jetha was he was a Sikh, he was a devotee, but he was he was a student. And Yogi Ji taught in that tradition. Now Kundalini Yoga as we know it from him um, is actually quite old and it goes back very far back. It, it, it was always taught by word of mouth. It is, it is a, a form of uh, Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga was developed for the rulers, for the, for the, the Kshatriya class primarily. So the, the rulers, the administrators, and the warriors learned this form of yoga. It was all taught by word of mouth, and it was all very secret. And when Yogi Ji came to the to the came to the West when he first went to Canada, he was teaching primarily Hatha Yoga because the the teachings were anybody who teaches this openly will not live to see their next birthday. It was always meant to be taught secretly, privately, and the student had to be tested pretty severely in order to qualify. In January of 1969, he was invited to Los Angeles to speak at the, the Sikh study circle in, in a Gurdwara there. And while, even though he had been to, to Toronto, to Canada, when he got to Los Angeles and saw the hippie scene there, he had never seen anything like that before. And he realized that what he had been teaching was not sufficient. It would not reach people who had been taking LSD and drugs like that. And so he made the decision to teach this sacred Kundalini yoga that had been taught to him by Sant Hazara Singh to teach it openly. And interesting enough, in that first year, it nearly killed him. I mean, he had such as the year wore on, he kept getting weaker and sicker, and some days he, he couldn't get up. And he said it was it was always our prayers for him that sustained him. And after about the first year and a half, he he rebounded and became much stronger and was able to continue his teaching. And then he became Mahan Tantric. And as Mahan Tantric, it was the same thing because he was processing that Tantric energy through his own body, through his own psyche. And that was, that was very hard on him. One of the things to understand is that true consciousness, true awareness, enlightenment, if you will, is not something that you learn. It's not something that's really taught. It's something that's transmitted by, from the teacher to the student, from, from the master to the disciple, however you'd like to, to look at it. Um, and he, he taught in that way. And a lot of what he did that, that he thought of as harsh or cruel was to break down the ego and the, the barriers that a student would put up so that there could be an open channel for that flow, for that transmission to take place. 
And so that's, that's really how it goes. I mean, sitting in the lecture, practicing all of the Kriyas, all of that's important. But when that flow happens, when that transmission from the, from the master to the student happens, that's when the experience comes. And that, that was what he was trying to do, to, to break down those barriers, break down those, those walls, break down the ego that we all have for that channel to be open and for that, that awareness to flow. And that was my experience with him. I mean, that, that's how he taught me. That's how he dealt with me. I mean, he, <laughs> I used to get calls from him, you know, probably a half dozen times a day. And he really liked to call me late at night. So I, I frequently would get calls. And, and understand, with a call security, I frequently work very late at night. And he seemed to know when I was asleep, because then he would call me and, you know, go after, just work on me in, in the way that he did. One time he called me and I fell asleep while he was talking to me. And I don't know if it's still this way, because I, I haven't actually used a landline phone in a long time. But in those days, if the landline was off the hook, after some time, it would make this dee -dee 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 kind of sound. And I fell asleep and dropped the phone. <laughs> and it was the, my phone making that dee -dee 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 sound that woke me up. And I figured, where, how did that happen? I couldn't even remember that he had called. And I went back to sleep. And then shortly thereafter, he called me and just, you know, bad joke. Went on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> And uh, it was it was pretty embarrassing, and, you know. But it was I had such gratitude that that he took that much interest in me. I never felt like he you know he'd wake up in the in the morning and, and think about well you know who can I abuse today? He, you know he was a teacher. He was guided to to those who needed it, and. You know, he, he, he used to say, because people really, you know, everybody wanted his praise. Everybody wanted him to say nice things to us. But he used to tell us, if I really love someone, then I want that person to grow. And I will be the most abusive and the, the most rude to that person to make them grow, to, to get all of that ego out. And he was certainly like that with me. But I, I always felt it was done with love. I mean, you know, he, he, he was very heavy with me. Somebody, um, Mukia Singh Sahib Liftar Singh called me one time and said, Sidi Singh Sahib is coming here and, we, we, you know, his, his area was also in the Caribbean. And he said, we're going to, to all of these islands, and I think you need to be here. And I said, is there, is there a security threat? And he said, well, there's not really a security threat, but if you're here, he'll yell at you and he won't yell at me. <laughs> so I, I was known for that at one time, but I was always grateful for it. So, Guru Fatta, where do we stand now? Hello? Right, you got to do unmute before you speak. Okay, so um, um, I had thought, my somebody's calling me. This is not good. Um, so um, I, you can hear me now. I just did unmute. 
Hello on the phone? I'm here, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so you can hear. Okay, um, so uh, I was thinking you might speak a little longer and have 10 minutes for questions, but if there are questions, uh, then- Well, I mean, I can, you know, I can be like an ancient city in Babylon, but I'm- I don't I, think you're uh, babbling. You're not babbling. <laughs> You know, I just, I, I thought it might be good to pause at this point. Sure. Um, somebody asked, who are the other teachers and their roles? I can address that a little bit uh, when I speak later on. Uh, Yogi's other teachers, I could do that. Um, let's think, um, what else is there? Uh, um, you want to talk about his role in, I mean, this was great. I think the, the big question is, you know, what was Yogi Bhajan's role as a, as a teacher and, and how the hell does all this, um, hardship fit into that picture. I think that's um, huge. Uh, you've done really well. Well, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I've emphasized that side too much. I mean, it wasn't always, you know, he wasn't always yelling. It wasn't always harsh. It wasn't always like that. Um, but those were the times when I felt like I was really growing, like, like, you know, I was really learning. And I, I'll tell you honestly, I mean, many of those times, I didn't even try to understand what he was saying. I just, I just kind of took it in as the energy, because I always felt like he wasn't talking to my conscious mind. He was talking to my soul, to my spiritual self. He was eating my karma. And I just, you know, wanted to let that happen. And I mean, because I, you know, I was around him a lot and I saw a lot of people argue with him and, and when he would start doing that, um, I, I never did. I, I mean, I just, you know, I, I just felt like he's my teacher and, I need to go through this. Um, but there were some times when I would, when I would talk back to him and that sort of thing. And sometimes it was appropriate and he appreciated it. Um, but it was always, you know, it was always for me, I felt I, like I was really being taught in a very traditional way. And I like that. I, I, I like that feeling and I like that energy. Not to say that when he was also complimentary and praised me for certain things, that felt great too. So, but it was, you know, it was, it, it made the relationship with him much more complete and much more intimate. Um, let's see, I'm just looking through some of the questions. Not a lot of questions. Some are questioning the existence of Santadara Singh. I can address that, um, or unless you want to talk about Shanti's research. Well, no, just you just go ahead. Um, I, you know, I, I met his son, actually. Yo, good. What, tell, talk about that. Well, it was one of the times that we were that we were in India, and um, City Singh Sahib had made contact with Sahazada's son. Sahazada had already passed on, and we went to the son's house. Um, you know, had tea, and and uh, there, you know, in the house there was this huge painting of Sahazada Singh. Um, and it was interesting talking to the son because he didn't have, he really didn't seem to have any deeply spiritual qualities. Um, not to say that he wasn't a good man. He, 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 was, he was a good man. And I met also his grandson, the son's son, uh, just two years ago when we were in, um, for, the, for the anniversary of, of Guru Gobind Singh's birth when we were in Patna. And, you know, it was, it was interesting to be in that space and, and in that energy because, you know, I could feel this kind of electrical 
current, I guess, that felt a lot like City Singside, but it was something else. It was was another energy. And the this technology is very ancient and it was always, as I said, quite esoteric, it was never taught openly. And there there are things about it that when you really do practice and you really do focus, bring out those energies. And I mean, it, it, I just, I, I felt kind of the, the ancient, um, you know, just, just the ancient elements and how far back this goes and how powerful it truly is. And I think that because he taught it openly, we don't recognize, many people don't recognize or don't, don't see it in that way as, as such a sacred science. Not to say that people don't benefit from doing it or feel great or, or have deep experiences, but it, it, it is a different dynamic because it's, it's so easily accessible now. And up until he started teaching it, it had not been. So that, that current it, that I felt there was, was very strong, but it, it, I realized that it's something that I feel throughout. And I think that's, that is the golden chain. And when we chant Om Namo Guru Dev Namo, it, it brings that, we, we tune into that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very real energy that flows through us. Uh, let me see. I'm just looking through questions here. Um, you know, there, there's several questions here about the sexual abuse. And I, I'll just say this. I traveled with him all over the world. I slept outside his door. And I never heard any moans, any cries, any, any pleas to stop or anything like that. So I never heard any... And, and I'm not saying that it didn't happen, that those who make those claims are wrong. I'm just saying I never, I never saw or heard anything that made me think that something like that was going on. I knew those staff people. I, I drove them around. I escorted them many times. Nobody complained to me. Nobody... You know, and I, I was friends with some of them. I mean, nobody, nobody came to me with any any concerns or complaints. Again, I'm not saying that they didn't happen, that it didn't exist. I just never saw it. I just, I never heard about it. Nobody mentioned anything to me. Um, and I, I knew many of them pretty well. So, I, I. I really can't address it any further than that because I just simply don't know. I, I, you know, I knew them all. I worked with them all. We were very close around city sink side and I just never saw anything that made me think there was something inappropriate that was going on. So, uh, that that's about all I I'm qualified to talk about regarding that. Um, let's see. Here's something. Why B created a lot of mantras, kriyas himself. I think there is no doubt about that. Which is 
not automatically bad. Sorry, I don't have all my classes, provided he had the capacity to do so. It will be essential to clarify the sources of his teachings. You know, there again, um, I, I've, you know, I mean, he, he, had, he had a number of different teachers. He always referred to Sant Hazada Singh as his main teacher. That's who his grandfather took him to when he was four years old. And, and he, he studied with him until he was 16. When, when Sant Hazada Singh told him he was now the master. And then when he was 18, partition happened and they had to, they had to cross the Ravi and move to Delhi because where, where Si Singh Saab was born and where he grew up is in what is now Pakistan. So he did, he had other teachers. I mean, he, it was, it was also from Sant Hazana Singh that he learned Gatka because Sant Hazana Singh was a Gatka master. And a lot of this comes from uh, the Nihang tradition as well, which is very, very mystical. Um, and then he, when he got to Delhi, he, he went to a number of teachers. He was always wanting to learn. He was always wanting to improve himself because with all of his experience, even with Sant Hazada telling him that he was the master, he didn't feel complete. And he was always searching for that which would make him feel complete. That's why he, he you know, developed, because he had the, the siddhas, the, the yogic powers. And the main ones that he had were, were Vayu, which is air, and Jal, which is water. And he talk about how he used to, he could stop the urine, stop somebody's urine. And um, so people were afraid of him. He would just walk up to somebody and squirt water from his hand into their faces and stuff just to prove that he had powers and stuff like that. And then if you've ever been to his house in Delhi, there is this park that's just across the street. I mean, it's in this kind of circle where there, there's a park in the middle. And he said that one day they were, there was a Kirtan program in that park and he was sitting there and he could see that these storm clouds were coming and it looked like it was going to rain. So he just used his powers and stopped the rain. After the Kirtan, this old, old man came up to him who he had never seen before. And this is like a neighborhood function. And the old man said, I know what you did. And Yogi Ji said, well, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything. He said, it was supposed to rain. You stopped it. And Yogi Ji said, yeah, well, I mean, the, the kitten was beautiful. There's no reason to, to, to let the rain disrupt it. And this guy says, you see every blade of grass here? It needed that rain. You see all these trees? They needed that rain. You see all these flowers? They also needed that rain. And Yogi Ji said, hey, no problem. I'll just have my orderlies come. They'll, they'll all water it by hand. We'll, we'll get that done tomorrow. And the old man said, no, Baba. You do it yourself. He said, when you leave your body, where do you think your soul will go? And he said, oh, yeah, where, wherever, wherever Guru takes it. And he says, no. You have developed these powers. You will be trapped in that, that element until you can overcome it. He said, you better, you better think about that and get started on it now. And then the guy turned and walked away. And he started asking, you know, yeah, did you see this old man? And nobody saw him. Did, didn't you see me talking to this old man? Nobody saw it. And so he realized that he needed to make some changes. 
And BBG says that it was at around this time where everything he would say started coming true. And then he was he, he was a customs officer. He worked for the for the government of India. He was assigned to Amritsar, to the Amritsar district. And he went there. He told this story once. He he said, you know, I went there and I walked to the Prakarma and I looked at the Hari Mandir. And he said, I'm ashamed to tell you because you how arrogant I was. I yelled, hey, I'm here. What are you going to do for me? He said, can you believe that arrogance? Can you believe that? And he, then he got the message, come every day and watch these floors. So he started doing that. And wherever he was, because he had to be all over that, that Punjab region, by three o'clock in the morning, he, if he had to ride his motorcycle or his Jeep, he would always be at the Pakarma in time to do the, the Ishnan Seva. And he did it every day for four years. And he begged Guru Ramdas to take those powers from him so that he'd never abuse them again. And then he was, he was reassigned to Delhi to the, to the airport, which then was called the Palam Airport. And it was while he was there that he met um, Birsa Singh, uh, Sant Birsa Singh, who taught him the long Ekumkar mantra. And he used to, because the, the Delhi airport, most of the flights would come in at night. And there was always a lull between 2.30 and around 5.30 in the morning when th there really weren't many flights. So he would drive his Jeep down to the end of the runway, have the radio with him, which he called the wireless. And he told his, he told his staff, his people, he said, there better be, the place better be burning down for you to disturb me. Nobody disturb me until I come back. And he would go down to the end of the runway and do his long Ekong car. And um, it, that was when he got what he, you know, said he saw God. And then it was shortly after that that he came to the West. He came to, to Toronto and then to Los Angeles. So he comes from that tradition. And this technology comes from that tradition. He had many teachers um, or a number. Of, he talked about, I remember he once gave us this Kriya. And, you know, it was exceedingly uncomfortable. And he said that when he did it, in, in the ashram where they were, there was, there was this teacher that was called the Dandguru. And he said, means that he carried a stick. And if you weren't in the posture correctly, he'd whack you with the stick until you got it right. And Siddhi Singh Sa was, you know, a, a big soccer player. And he got injured playing soccer. And he had to pull, I think it was full lotus. And he couldn't, he couldn't get into it because of, of the injury. And the Dun Guru said, sit here and pull it. And he goes, I, I, I can't. My, my knee, you know, it really hurts. I can't, I can't bend it like that. And the, the Dun Guru whacked him on the back. He said, I still have that scar. And he does. He had a mark on his back. Pull it. And he said, that hurt worse than my knee. And I pulled it up and did it perfectly. So he came through that. He came from that tradition. And he always talked about how we as Westerners don't understand what a spiritual teacher is. And he, he always said, 
I know you want to think of me as a man and you want to apply those terms. He said, and do that if you like, but you're wrong. Don't think of me in that way because I'm just an energy. I'm not a personality. Why Guru? So what else? It, it could be bedtime for you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fine to carry on a while. Um, I can, I can start up a bit and if you want to chime in, sure, uh, go ahead. feel free. Um, and if people, you know, we're reading the questions here. Um, oh, wait, let me, yeah, let me, let me look at this question. What is your suppositions about why all this is happening now? Why all this, these ladies are talking about abuses and not when he was alive. What is this meant for? You know, I've pondered that actually. <clears throat> what's going on um now there's some interesting if, if you follow astrology there's some interesting transits that by their nature bring things out but i also feel that you know and it's curious that this is going on um the coronavirus and you know this this global lockdown and kind of repression of of personal liberties and freedoms is happening. It's, it's a very curious and strange time. So it's, it's something that is meant to bring a change and meant to bring a transition. And certainly with these allegations, I think that will go far toward kind of removing a focus on the personality and shifting the focus more to the essence of the teachings. Because he always said, you know, don't look at me, look at the teachings. And he used to, he used to say, you know, in my role as a teacher, I will freak you out. I will abuse you. He said, you know, he used to say, I'll come into your classes and do weird things just to freak you out. And he did stuff like that. And I think that all of these circumstances are happening now to make us as students, as, you know, we chant Om Namo Guru Dev Namo before class, before we do any, anything. And that brings us, brings the golden chain flowing through us. Yuriji explained it as it's the golden, he said it's the satsangodata, which means the golden chain of reality. And it flows. And it was Guru Nanak who actually brought that to the earth. And it passed through all the 10 gurus and on and on and on. And so anyone who chants, that gets you know has that flow has that energy going through us and i think that these things that are happening are to bring the focus more to that energy and away from the personality of of yogi bhajan and he was an extraordinary personality. I mean, I've met presidents, I've met the Pope, I've met rock stars, I've met porn stars. I've never met anybody like him. I never met anybody who, who could impact me or anybody else like him. And whoever he was, he was, he was, from my perspective and my experience with him, just something remarkable. And I always felt it was, you know, a divine gift to, to have that experience with him. I think this is happening. And he, he, he told me, 
And he, he mentioned it in his lectures as well, that after his time, the organization would go on. There would be power struggles and people trying to get power and control and trying to get money. And he said, once all the money is gone and once all the power has been taken, there won't be anything left and those people will go away. He said, there'll be a few left. And from those few who understand and have the experience of consciousness, a new organization will emerge. And that, that is what will last, he said, for 5,000 years. But it won't be personality-centric. You know, Guru Gobind Singh did not appoint another person. And I've always believed that for many reasons, but, but one of the reasons that his four sons died was because had any of them survived, the Sikhs would have tried to force them into a guruship. And he had to, Guru Gobind Singh had to completely cut that off. And, you know, give the guruship to the Adi Granth, which became the city Guru Granth. And the golden chain flows through that. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that to do Kundalini Yoga, you have to be Sikh. But where these mantras come from, where a lot of the, the tradition and the philosophy, I guess, comes from it comes from that tradition now Sikh Dharma came out of a movement that began probably around the 13th century or so um, called the Bhakti movement and it was these Bhakti saints who were both Sufi Muslim and Hindu um, that kind of like what was happening in, in Europe with, with the church and, you know, with people like Martin Luther and, and uh, some of the other great reformers. Anyway, they said, you know, like, like for the Brahma, for the Hindus, the Brahmins, the, the pundits had, tremendous power and authority over people and the they refused to teach the vedas or sanskrit or or anything like that to people who they they thought were of lower caste and in the the sufi tradition it was the same thing it was it was that why do we have to go through uh, a mala? We should be able to talk to God direct. God speaks to us. God speaks through us. So this is called the Bhakti movement. And some of the writings of the Bhakti saints are found in the city of Guru Granth. Then out of that Bhakti movement came Guru Nanak. And the the Sikh tradition and, and the, the Ten Gurus. But Guru Gobind Singh returned the guruship to the Granth, not to a personality, because the whole intent was that it should be about the Nam, you know, the, the name, the, the chanting, the reciting, the the, the personal practice and the personal experience, not about a personality. And Yogi G came, he taught in a very you know, significant way. And, but his personality was so powerful, people got caught up with that. And to the point that a lot, it's been more about personality in many ways than about the, the pure essence of the teachings. 
And I think a lot of this is happening to shift that focus away from personality and really on to the nitty gritty of what the teachings are. Another question, if you'd like to address it, uh, Sarab Kalakor asks, do you really believe Yogi Bhajan a saint with a superpower to remove your karma? You know, I think that he was a great master. I think he had that power. Um, whether he was a saint or not, um, in my opinion, is immaterial. Um, because I, I think that, I, I think saint, the term saint, the whole, the whole um, saint theory, if you will, is really more a marketing ploy. We're all saints. We all have that capacity. Anybody, everybody. As elevated and divine as a person can be, as mean and cruel and base and dark as a person can be, we all have that in us. We decide where it's going to go. Destiny has a certain play there to bring influences but we have free will and it is the power of free will that it's those decisions that we make. Um, I mean, you know, I think for myself, I, you know, I was just some guy. I, I was born in Atlanta in, in the Southern part of the United States. I grew up in the fifties and sixties. So I'm a, I'm a geezer. So, you know, I, when I was, when I was growing up, um, segregation and racism, especially in that part of the United States, was severe. I mean, it was really, really harsh. And I grew up through that and, and Martin Luther King and the changes he brought and the Kennedy assassination and the Vietnam War and 9-11 and, and all of that. And I've seen all of these things happen. And I just, I, I feel that this is a time when the entire consciousness of the planet is changing. And right now, it's hanging in the balance. And it's whether those who have the divinity and the technology and the devotion to raise the consciousness will do so or not. And I think the future of this organization and really the, the future of, of the world, the globe, depends on that. I'm not saying it all has to come from Kundalini Yoga is taught by Yogi Bhajan, but there is a shifting in consciousness. And, you know, Yogi Ji used to say, for example, the only true path, he was at, we were at um, some, um, it was a, uh, where all of these had, all of the, it was like an interreligious council but very high ranking clergymen representing their different their different groups were there. So there was it was there were Muslim mullahs, there were priests, there were bishops, there were you know all of this. And they got into this this discussion about you know what's what's the best path, what's the best way. And Yogi said there's only one true path so what and they expected him to say seek or something like that and he, he said it is the path of righteousness and you only walk it with true devotion 
So I, I think that's so, you know, whatever your path is, however you, you relate to your divine self, it is, if, if it's with devotion, then it, it's, it works. It's right. You can't, you can't argue it. And I think that's the, this is happening to bring that consciousness now. It's kind of like this in the sixties, all of that happened and all of the drugs and everything, because <clears throat> there had to be this very accelerated shift in consciousness. It, it had to happen for, for the coming of the Aquarian age. And that's, so the, you know, that those hippie days and LSD and all that facilitated that transition. Now we're at another point where the consciousness has to move up another notch. And I think that's why all of this is happening now. Well, I agree. Shall I fill the silence? Ritesh? Yeah, so... Carry on. You're doing a fine job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say you are. Um, so uh, the question did come up about Yogiji's teachers. That's one question that came up. And um, Yogiji himself, in fact, Shakti Parwa, his first student in the States, uh, she made a list. She Sorry? Compiled a list. Shakti Parwa, Kar, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So she compiled a list at one time, which was uh, given to me. I think some of it was published in the man called City Singh Science, because it is a question, you know, history. We want to know this stuff. So his, his first teacher was his uh, grandfather, Santipate Singh, who basically taught him to give up his animal nature. Um, Santa Zara Singh, we talked about quite a bit. Um, Santaran Jeet Singh in the 1940s uh, taught him also. Um, the concept of universal spirituality. Uh, there's a Swami, you can still find videos of him on, on YouTube, Swami Dev Murthy, who taught him Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, right. impressive yogi. Uh, there's another called Acharya Narendra Dev of uh, Yoga Smart, apparently, Mandir Lane, New Delhi, who taught him uh, Hatha Yoga and uh, postures and the impact on the nervous system. Uh, him I couldn't find anything about. Um, then there's the, the Swami that Yogi taught in his uh, ashram in New Delhi, uh, Swami Darindra Brahmacharya, who is also yeah. uh, a teacher of uh, the Gandhis. Um, that's where uh, Yogi Ji met his, uh, the Canadian High Commissioner who allowed him to come to Canada, who facilitated that, and uh, so a very well-known center in Delhi. And uh, in the list also is uh, uh, Swami Shivananda, Shivananda Ashram. Yogi Ji went there. Um, if, if you listen to Yogi's stories or if you read the, his biography, you'll note that he also talks about a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers, and many of them he doesn't attach a name to. So he uh, had many, many teachers, and uh, much as I think Gurtej is um, saying, you know, we don't really want to focus on the personality. I mean, Yogiji didn't quote Santa Zara saying, we'll often quote. Yogi Bhajan said this, said that, but uh, Yogi Ji would tell stories about Santa Zara Singh, but um, not say, you know, Santa Zara Singh, the famous sayings of Santa Zara Singh. He never went there. He would send us to Guru Granth Sahib. He would send us to Shabad Guru. He would say, Guru Nanak said this. But as far as um, you know, personalities, uh, he never went there. He, he also didn't talk about his brother and sister. I don't think he spoke once in a lecture. He mentioned either of them. Because uh, I'm sure he was aware that uh, the personality cult uh, takes root very easily. So that that answers uh, that question. Um, if you want, I can go on. I mean, I, there has been a question about who is Philip de Sleep, and uh, I can go into that. Gritesh, if you're fading and you want to say a final whatever, please go ahead or just stick with us. How are you doing? I'll, I'll hang in for a bit longer. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you everyone thank you everyone for listening why guru um 
criticism happens for a reason, and, and, this, and the criticism isn't always what people say. It, there's, just, there's, a, there's a criticism behind the criticism sometimes. And I was very fortunate. I, um, my uh, artist for the biography, and Siddhikar Tarkar, told me a um, fascinating story uh, from her time in Los Angeles and her experience with uh, Philip Desley. Um, which helps to explain why Philip S. Deep is really quite a critic. And he's giving his webinar tomorrow. You're all welcome to go. I I'm going to talk about some of his points. I'm going to critique his critique. But uh, here's, here's what the story is. And it ties in with uh, an experience I had yesterday. A lot of people did Council Council uh, with two days this year. And um, uh, it was uh, online. And I was there for about half hour at the end there. And the Council Council being mindful of these accusations, he invited um, some of the accusers, the people who alleged this and that happened, to come and to speak openly. And uh, they did, and I was able to, um, to uh, hear some of that over about a half hour. And um, those are, um, they made very um, strong allegations. And um, um, so we, um, I think I'm losing my track here. Um, so, oh yes. So one of the things that came out of that was that, um, and, and there were a lot of things alleged and a lot of things were said. I heard about seven people speak. One thing that was, uh, that, that was alleged, and I think rightfully alleged, was that there's a lot of uh, enabling. You know, people screw up, people abuse other people in our community, and, um, and others just shut up, which is not really, um, it is not okay. I mean, if you're wearing white and dressing spectacularly in your turban and you're going saying, well, we want to be healthy, happy, and holy. If somebody's abusing somebody in your community, it, it behooves you. It's, it's your, your responsibility to do something about it. So um, the story goes that um, Philip came to Los Angeles and was working on his uh, academic progress and the uh, U.S. is an expensive place and they needed to make money. And he found work uh, helping a lady with cancer in the Los Angeles community who happened to be a, a good friend of Siri Qatar's. And um, he was suited to that because his mother had had cancer and she had died of cancer and he had been her caregiver. So this really resonated with him, helping this lady out. Uh, as uh, Siri Qatar told the story, um, this lady was married, and uh, in the course of her treatment, her husband was philandering about. He uh, uh, had a relationship with a woman. Uh, Sir Katarikar described her as evil. She would spoken. She spoke with that woman, and she spoke with the husband, confronted him a number of times. But uh, as a Sangat, as a community, mostly people didn't say boo. And uh, that apparently scarred uh, Philip de Sleep. He said, what the... Uh, heck is this? I mean, Ritesh told a lovely story about the Sangha, the community co coming together and giving him healing when he needed it, but there's also a corrective function of a, of a congregation, and that was uh, sleeping, and uh, that scarred him, and so he's come out as a, as a you know, pretty vocal critic of, of Yogiji, and uh, He's trying to take him apart. He published a paper 2012, and I'll go through his critiques. But I just want to say that um, uh, Sir Kartar is saying too, he's a good man. He just had a really bad experience with us, and, um, and uh, that's understandable. So um, going through his paper and his critique, um, he critiques the concept of the golden chain. Um, and Ritesh, you can, you can step in anytime your understanding of the golden chain may be different than mine. You have something to add, feel, feel free. Um, uh, he is saying, Philippe, that um, a series of things I've just uh, can only point to himself and Santa Zara Singh and didn't really point beyond that. I, I personally re don't recall hearing of the golden chain until about the early 90s. And I started in 1972. So personally, it's not a big, big thing for me, the golden chain, you know, who is two steps ahead of Yogi Bhajan. Um, you know, that's one of the things that, um, um, that uh, Philip uh, critiques. And uh, he critiques also um, 
you know, our understanding of uh, uh, Vyasa Singh. Um, if you follow the, if you read the biography, for example, um, you may know that um, Yogiji did study with Vyasa Singh, but when he came to India with his uh, uh, entourage, with it, he brought 108 or 109 uh, students, so he was 84, a lot, um, that um, Virsa Singh wanted them to be his followers. And Yogaji had a break with Virsa Singh then. He said, and I'm sure he was like any human being, he was figuring this out as he went, but he, he realized at some point, maybe just right at that trip there, maybe just in that time with the sense of Singh that um, this was not really in, in our interest, that um, there's something much bigger than following another personality. And uh, he wanted to give us to the Guru Granth Sahib. He wanted to give us to um, that lineage rather than to, uh, which basically is, is, is the, the word, the Shabbat Guru, um, rather than to another. You know, I, uh, forgive me for stepping in, but I yeah. mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, he did not come to the West with, you know, thinking that he would become what he became and that it would grow as big and as fast as it did. His intention originally was to go to Canada, teach Hatha Yoga, and make some money and then go back to India and, and retire and, and, you know, kind of as a, as a well-known teacher and have students and that, you know, maybe an ashram in Delhi or something. And <clears throat> that was kind of what he thought, <clears throat> but it just grew and grew. And, you know, the more he taught and the more he, he engaged with people, the more it became clear to him what laid ahead and what he had to do. I think it was in 71 that he became Mahan Tantric, which was, you know, a, a, another change, another, another powerful thing that happened. And he, so he started teaching white Tantric yoga, which, you know, has been transformational for many, many people. Um, and then he, he continued to teach and increasingly people became interested in the teachings of the Sikhs. Um, because he had, you know, when he first came, he had a, had a little cassette tape that had the, the um, Sukhmani, was recording of Sukhmani by Professor Satnam Singh. And, and, and he had his Sundar Gutka. <clears throat> and that was, those were really precious to him. He, but he had us start to do Japji. He, you know, he had the, Fremka did the translation of some of the Bonnies and that became Peace Lagoon. And people started reading it and wanted to learn more and wanted to, you know, guys started tying turbans and growing beards and the ladies started saying, you know, not shaving their legs and stuff. And it just sort of happened. And, and he was amazed by it and, and recognized clearly the hand of Guru Ramdas. And he always was specific about it being Guru Ramdas because he had that experience when they went to India for the first time and Sant Hazada Singh tried to get Yogi Ji to have all of this, his students come and, and bow to him. Baba Virsa Singh, you, you said Baba Virsa yeah, Singh. And, um, it, you know, that, that, that didn't happen because he had this, because Virsa Singh said, I'm your guru. And Yogi he said, no, you're not. He said, I'm your guru. Then if I'm not, who's your guru? And he said, Guru Ramdas. And he said, I gave you the Ekong Kran Satnam Sri Vai Guru Mantra. The guru gives the mantra, I'm your guru. He said, what guru has Guru Ramdas given you? Or what mantra has Guru Ramdas given you? 
he said, I'll tell you in the morning. And that, that night, he, he meditated and called on Guru Ram Das and he said, hey, <laughs> you got to get me out of this. He said, Guru Ram Das appeared before him. He said he was as real as you are sitting before me right now. And Shantikar once asked him, said, <clears throat> did you try to touch him? And he said, I did. He said, I reached out because I didn't believe it. He said, I reached out and touched his foot. And it was as real as if I touched your foot. He said, I felt so ashamed for doubting it. I mean, I really was ashamed that I, that I doubted. And he said, Guru sat with me and started just chanting, Guru, Guru, Wahi Guru, Guru Ram Das Guru, 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 Wahi Guru, Guru Ram Das Guru. And he realized this is the mantra from the Guru. So the next day he went to Birsa Singh. He said, this is my mantra. And that's, that's how, how the Guru Guru Wahi Guru Guru Ram Das mantra came to be. So um, he came back, you know, he came back from India. And because up until that time, he'd been talking about his master, Birsa Singh. I mean, he, he, was, he was in love with him. So Birsa Singh gave Yogi Ji a pair of his chapels, you know, those wooden chapel sandals that he brought with him. When he, when he came to the West and he set them up on his altar, he used to bow to them every day. And after that, there was, an, there was never another mention of their system. Anyway, yeah, back to you. Good. Well, well said. Uh, and I really appreciate your being there because you were there. Um, so the critique again, um, so, yeah, indeed, versus saying you never talked about him again. So, I mean, but he's in the biography. You know, if you want to read the story, uh, you may have never spoken to Virsa Singh again, but it's a matter of record. And if you read the Messenger from the Guru's House, which is the title Yogiji gave for his story, it's, it's there. Um, it's true that uh, Yogiji, especially at the beginning, focused a lot on the navel, and that happens to be the almost the sole focus of his teacher in Delhi, uh, Swami Darindra Brahmachari. Uh, I've seen a book of his, and it's all navel, 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 uh, which is you know, very familiar to us. Um, uh, so what, what uh, the sleep is alleging is that all Yogiji taught was just a mixture of Virsa Singh and Darindra, and I think he's aware of another one of the other teachers. Uh, in fact, I was having a, an exchange on, a, on Facebook with uh, with Philip the other day, and um, he said, well, most of the Kriyas are from uh, Darindra and uh, one other teacher. But I, I challenged him, because if Yogiji had all in all, maybe uh, 50 teachers, you know, how can you quantify? I mean, if you're yeah. a scholar, if you're a scholar, you have to be able to have a citation and a written work. But if most of the yoga tradition is oral, you can't do that. So, I mean, it makes you look good if you can say, well, these two, uh, I, I can say, um, you know, they wrote books and they're historic figures and most of his work came from that. But you can't really quantify that. For all we know, maybe uh, it's more closer to one or two percent of what he taught came from, um, came from Virsa Singh and uh, Dharendra Brahmacharya. Given, you know, if you think about it, Yogiji taught maybe um, a couple of thousand Kriyas, maybe, maybe more. And uh, he couldn't, no, there's no way that all came from there. Where exactly it came from? Um, well, we can say the golden chain. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really, what I do know, I'll tell you a story that, that corresponds to this. I mean, Yogiji was very, very perceptive. And I asked um, somebody, I mean, I, I'm a very gung-ho guy. So I like to, I don't mind making fun of myself. You know, I, I dive deep into it. I got a spiritual name, I made it legal wearing white, I just dived in, maybe I'm stupid. 
But uh, there's a guy in Los Angeles who also went on that India trip called Dr. Allen, Allen Weiss, and very smart guy, became a surgeon. I mean, you don't be dumb and become a surgeon. Very smart, very sharp. And he's still Dr. Allen Weiss. He's Dr. Allen Singh Weiss. And it took a while for him to put on a turban. A lot of people stick around. They never put on a turban. But, you know, so he's very sharp, a very critical mind. And like myself, when Yogaji would come here, he watched Yogaji like a hawk. You know, he wanted to study not only what he said, but what he did. And, um, and he noticed something in those early days. And we were all quite young and uh, fertile. And uh, he noticed that uh, one after another, he noticed these ladies, uh, Yogaji would say to them, congratulations on your pregnancy. And, uh, well, that's fine. But they would say they're not pregnant. <laughs> Dr. Allen knows what is this. And then, uh, then after a time, he noticed all of these women, they would come back, all of these young women, and said, Yogi, how did you know I was pregnant? And so finally, Dr. Allen, um, it was too much. She had to ask. And so Yogi explained, you know, everybody has uh, a magnetic field. Everybody has an aura, and he has the capacity to see the aura. Now, when a woman is pregnant, there are two magnetic fields. And it's easy, he can see that. And that's, that was his cue. And Dr. Allen said, yeah. yeah. I mean, who can see that? So I'm presuming, I mean, Yogi talked about the aura, especially during the country courses. He would say, you know, well, you know, you got to do this Kriya a little more. We'd already been doing it for God knows how long. But I, I want your aura to be blue and it's not quite there yet. So go, go, go. And so he had that sensitivity. And I can, I can imagine him um, using that sensitivity to guide him. Um, I'm speculating. I mean, where does this, where do these kriyas come from? Certainly, there was a, a lot of guidance. But once he verbalizes the guidance that he has and gives us direction, he also gets immediate feedback. It's not like today where you do a blood sample or you check the EEG and maybe it, you know uh, maybe the EEG will break down. But he was there on the spot watching what the kriya did, and he could make alterations and. Um, that's my speculation, how he worked. But he was very, very sensitive. Yes, he brought, oh, his yoga books were lost. He brought a book, book uh, apparently a, a suitcase full of yoga books, and they were all lost um, in his coming here. So he had to be uh, a channel, and he had to use his memory, and he worked from within. Um, so, uh, yeah, break with Maharaj. Yeah. Mirsa Singh doubts the concept of Mahatantric. Uh, he challenges, uh, you know, whether some Hazara Singh was uh, Mahatantric too. He challenges a lot of stuff. I, frankly, I don't understand a lot, but I know if something works. I, I'm working with my laptop here, which I totally don't understand, um, but it really serves us. And um, in the same way, the white tantric yoga, sometimes I joke with my students. Um, I say to them, you know, Yogaji tricked us because we'll only do so much Kundalini yoga on our own or even in his class. You know, there's a certain limit, da, da, da. But he tricked us. He got us matched up with somebody of the opposite gender. and Nobody wants to lose faith. Face. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. They want to look good in front of that opposite number, who may be your girlfriend or maybe just somebody you don't know, but you don't want to have your arms come down and look the fool when everybody else is keeping their arms up. So maybe that's a part of it. Maybe it's not. You could even talk about the energy bouncing off of the sun. I have no idea how that works. But all I know is that white country yoga um, has taken us places and has transformed a lot of people's lives. I didn't understand it. But um, it's there. It's a very important part of his teachings. And um, I think sometimes, you know, if you're on a path like this, you just have to say, you know, there's some things you're not going to understand. But if you're an academic, of course, you have to pretend to, <laughs> to understand everything. And uh, if you don't understand, you say, well, there's, there's no citation for this. It's just um, hearsay evidence, blah, blah, blah. God bless the academics who are trying to understand and to write about kundalini yoga i think there are real real limitations there real problems um you know jogiji i think one of the difficulties with uh, you know the critical 
I remember, you know, since a young age, and my parents came from Nazi Germany, you know, I've got a history of trying to figure out why adults are so stupid and, and, and hoping that we don't repeat older generations' mistakes. And, uh, we, you know, we do have a bias as um, spiritual people. The pictures of Guru Nanak, we all get their pictures of Guru Nanak in his old age. Nobody hardly sees, nobody bothers with painting Guru Nanak in his, the prime of his life, but he was teaching all his life. So there's all this bias, Babaji, you know, old people. But um, um, we forget that, um, you know, I've been, I think maybe I'll do this soon because I've been asking for support um, uh, to do this. I think I'll just not bother. But uh, one of Yogaji's very prized students was um, oh, 15, I think, when he came to Yogaji. And um, he so blossomed. Um, and you know, it's a weird thing. I have a mental block right now. Who's our first Baisab? Do you remember? Baisab Delson. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Baisab Delson. He was brilliant. And um, he and he only lived till he was maybe 19, car crash. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, a bias toward um, the elderly. I mean, it's nice to have reverence for the elderly. It's also nice to have respect for the young. I think that, was, that came out in last night's forum as well, that um, the young don't feel they're being heard. But um, uh, I think, um, you know, Yogiji um, addressed, that's one of the beauties that we young people felt we were uh, being listened to. And um, I think I'm just losing my track here a little bit, but um, um, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so I, I will be writing that and somehow we're on the, oh, here's what it is. So the, the, the academics, they need to have citations, they need to have books, they need to have recordings, and if they don't have that, um, it didn't happen. Yogiji, and here's where the academics are going to differ. Yogiji was not a, a bean counter. Yogiji was not a um, rational always. And here's what I was going to say to myself. That's right. Um, as a young man, I realized, you know, rationally, we're not going to figure out the big solutions in our life. We have to understand people. We have to understand the mind. So I was good with math. But I kind of left that behind when I was a young man. I said, this is not going to solve the problems of the world. And I think Yogaji, you know, he had a degree in economics. He was smart. He could manage businesses. He helped considerably. But he was a visionary. And he came from the tradition of Jesus and Buddha in the sense that he was a great storyteller, a master storyteller. And, you know, when, when uh, Philip contacted me a few years ago and was working on this paper, and he asked about Santa Zara Singh, and that's before I heard that there was a picture and you know these stories of people actually making contact with his uh, descendants. I said, you know, there's a Sufi tradition that if if something inspires, it's true. You know, and uh, if it doesn't inspire, it's not true. And I believe Krishna had some arguments with Yoga Jira about what is truth. And um, I remember, you know, here in uh, in Toronto, there was a case early on which I researched and. Uh, Yogi said to somebody, you know, all this land is outside of Toronto. Uh, you can make it into an ashram and it will live on for a long time. And, you know, la, 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 la. Well, the, the person ended up not following through and it didn't happen. And there's another case. And please, under, I, I don't know if you're going to all understand this, but Yogi changed the world in a fundamental way by being a great teacher and a great storyteller. Uh, he, he told stories about the snow in Canada and how he survived that. Those are great stories. Um, and they helped make our legacy and a very important part of, you know, they inspired us, you know. So if we're in a snowstorm, we can think back to what Yogaji would have done. Now, doing my critical research, I found that actually when he was here, it was never that cold. And there was no, it was Canada, but uh, there wasn't any snow in, in Toronto. And so what do, we, what do you do? What do I do with that when I'm writing Yogi's biography? I say, well, this is part of his legacy. He's a great, he's here to inspire us, not to tell us what the weather was in Toronto in December 1968. Who cares what the weather was? He was giving us a, a he was being a role model. He was giving us a legacy. He was creating a mythology. And that's where I think 
critics, some critics just fall off. They, they don't get the, the breadth and the extent of what Yogaji did. You know, there's a lot of academics cannot change the world by academic work alone. You don't change somebody's heart by um, telling them, you know, material facts. You've got to know people's hearts and you've got to know how to inspire them. And Yogaji was masterful at that. And that's, I think, maybe the final word I'll say about Philip um, Desli. Love the man. I mean, I appreciate his intention. I appreciate how he got embittered. Um, that's my critique of his academic paper. Ritesh, anything more you want to say? Are you still awake? No, I, I mean, uh, yes, I'm still awake, but no, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you've summed it up really well. Um, you know, one of the things about him was he had this amazing capacity to draw on all of his experiences for the purpose of his teaching. And because he, his experience was so vast, I mean, he grew up, he used to say he was like Prince of Wales. Um, because his grandfather was very wealthy and owned several villages. And <clears throat> I, I remember going with him, with Yogi G, to the Palace of Versailles in, in France, in, in Paris. And we started walking through it. And he, he started pointing out, this room is for this, that room is for that. The next room is going to be this. And he knew exactly the layout. And he said, this is exactly how my grandfather's house was laid out. Mm -hmm. So he grew up with that kind of opulence. And then he, but it was also, you know, they were also farmers. I mean, this is, this was in the, the 30s. 30s and 40s, 1930s and 1940s when he was, so they were still under British rule, was still quite primitive in that part of India, it, virtually no paved roads, uh, virtually no cars really. And they rode horses and farmed and also had, you know, mudges, those water buffaloes. And he talked about, you know, having to, to milk the mudges in the morning and you know, doing, doing that kind of agricultural work, um, even though he was quite wealthy, everybody, everybody worked. And then his, he, he said he would sit with his grandfather every morning and he, he would listen to his grandfather do japji. Then his grandfather would have Yogiji recite Japji and he would sit, his grandfather would sit in a very meditative state and listen to Yogi Ji recite. And this, you know, he was, he was like a three or four year old at that time. And he, and he said, one time Yogi Ji said, no, I want to, let's just do it together. And his grandfather said, no. He said, I want to respect you and I want to respect Guru's word. So I want to sit and listen to your recitation because that is your expression when you recite. And that, you know, it's things like that that really stuck with him that he, he used so much as a teacher. But he had all of this experience. Then, you know, he went to university, got his uh, master's degree in economics, but he was also in, in the army at the same time serving in the army and there were a number of different conflicts that he had to deal with and then with his degree in economics he went into to the um, to the uh, customs service and he was a customs officer and they had to go after these smugglings very big and he worked all along india's border and they would they would have to intercept these these bandits and arrest them and <clears throat> big gunfights and that sort of thing. So his his experience was exceedingly vast. Mm. 
And in all of his experience, when he got to, to Los Angeles, he could not believe what he saw and what he, you know, what, how people were living. Mm. Big switch. He's, sorry? Yeah, big change. Yeah. And, but all of, all of his experience, his worldly experience, in harmony with his spiritual and yogic experience, made him the teacher that he was. And whatever the allegations are, I'm not addressing that. But I mean, I know very, very few people, if any, who ever sat in one of his lectures or had a personal face-to-face -face meeting with him who were not just stunned, just their world totally rocked by his presence and by meeting with him. He had that, he just had that vibration that, you know, he, he, he used to tell us because in, in New Mexico, if those of you who've been there to, he had the ranch and in the ranch house is where he would sit and people would have appointments with him and go and see him and that kind of thing. And he said, as soon as you walk in the door of the ranch, and I feel your aura. I've already taken care of your problem. You know, whatever it is, it's, it's resolved. I just want to talk to you a little while to make sure you're okay. So, and, and I mean, <laughs> I can verify that I had that experience with him. And I've talked to others who did as well. So he, he, his presence was very deeply penetrating. And, you know, it was like penetrating into the psyche to elevate the consciousness. And it was a profound experience. My experience is mostly um, long distance. When I moved into Guru Ram Das Ashram, our training in those days, teacher training was uh, move in, serve everybody, pay your rent, uh, do sadhana every day, teach one class a week, and write Yogi Bhajan once a month. So that's where my, our relationship started. And um, he was very busy. Uh, I didn't always get one letter back for each letter, but every letter was very gracious. And... You know, he awakened before internet, before uh, cell phones. Um, he awakened in me um, a kind of sensitivity. So I would feel when there was a letter of his in the mailbox. I would feel it about the day before that it was coming. And uh, so his projection indeed was, was immense. Um, uh, he drove by my house. <laughs> I mean, literally. Uh, when I was 15, he drove on the highway, it must have been, because he went to drove from Toronto to Ottawa. And, you know, that was a few miles away. I, I think I, I felt that, you know, and I wanted to leave home. I was 16, I left. Um, his projection indeed was uh, immense, and, and it, it, it hasn't ended, because people would say, well, what are we going to do, Yogi G, when you die? And he said, don't worry, I'll just be faster. And uh, even Gurtej and I were having an exchange you know, he sent me some emails and they disappeared. And I said, uh, it's Yoga G at work. Because I know he works in electronics. He's mm -hmm. good with that. I mean, seriously. Um, weird stuff happens. And uh, you can call it a gremlin. But <clears throat> if, it's, it's, if it's the best in my computer, very often I'll say, yeah, thank you, Yoga G. <laughs> I know you're here. Well, you know, he, he did a lot of his counseling and work on the phone. And he said he always liked that because talking on the phone, you know, helped him to feel the vibration of the person he was talking to and made it easier for him to send energy to them 
so he, he he liked talking on the phone and he he was on the phone i mean like i said he he only slept two to three hours a day i mean normally um he would because he would be up until around two thirty, and then then every day he would he would at two thirty he would go in and do his sadhana and his sadhana was in in those days he would read the entire sundar gutka from start to finish and he read it in urdu the sundar gutka was written in urdu not not in gurmukhi and he um he would do that then he would sleep a couple of hours um and then get on with the you know get up have his have his bath or his shower start making phone calls then start making phone calls or start seeing people i mean it was was continuous and in in new mexico he those of you who've been to the ranch, you know that he had his dome there and that, that was where he slept and where he, he stayed. He would usually come out of the dome somewhere between 10 and 11 in the morning. He'd go into the ranch house and start receiving people because normally, normally he didn't receive people in the dome, but he would receive them in the ranch house. So people would have appointments or he'd want to talk to somebody then it was done in the ranch house. And that would go on until two in the morning. I mean, you know, there were times when he would, he'd like to go to movies or we would go, go out to eat or something like that. But the, all of that time, I mean, he would be sitting there talking with people one after the other after the other with all kinds of crazy stories. I mean, it was just really amazing. So some of the things that some of the problems people were dealing with or that, that he helped people to deal with. And then he would anonymize them. So nobody's embarrassed. Um, but, uh, right. you know, you, uh, you know, we have kind of parables, parables that, uh, that, um, we know of uh, Jesus telling and the Buddha tells these kind of parables. But Yogaji, his stories are mostly psychological studies. And yeah. all based, most, mostly on his own experience. They occasionally he would talk about Lord Krishna or, or uh, Moses. But a lot of his, his lectures, he would learn from us and then take those as um, learning points and share with us what he observed. He was constantly, he would say one reason he went to the movies, two reasons. One, in quiet time. You know, nobody's bugging him. And uh, the second is he, these are great psychological studies to understand, you know, what do we make our movies tell us about ourselves. And so he, he studied us that way. But, and then, you know, a lot of that was just food for, for his teaching, food for his teaching. If he didn't, um, I'm sure he poked and provoked us sometimes just to see what the heck these crazy North Americans or Europeans would do. So he understands us, uh, you know, our, our, trigger points, our limitations, uh, so he can work on us, but also so that he can, I mean, if he doesn't understand it, he doesn't know what the limitations are, our boundaries are, um, he can't work with us so well. So poke, provoke, observe, and elevate. I, he worked like that a lot and so much of his stories. And, you know, to write a biography, I heard so many stories, most of them didn't go into the written biography, but, you know, if you go to the KRI Library of Teachings, as long as these lectures are still there, you can listen to a lot of them. And uh, some are heart wrenching, some are inspiring, always instructive. As, as uh, Gurtej Singh said, Yogi never stopped being an uh, instructor. He never told gossip, he told instruction. He called me one day and he said, I said a prayer for you today. <laughs> and I, said, I said, Thank you, sir. I'm sure all your prayers are answered. He said, well, you don't know what my prayer was. I said, I think I'm about to find out. He said, I prayed that when you go out today, you get run over by a bus. He said, at least then all your bullshit will end and you can start over. And then he hung up. <laughs>
I love that story. He told me, Ritesh told me that a few months ago, and I put it into the bio, so you, you won't miss it. Just, just find it there. Yeah, he, he was very, he was like that sometimes. Um, yeah. yeah, he was. Yeah. We had, um, um, get on another topic, uh, sources of the mantras that Yogiji gave us. I mean, Kriya is so much I can't say, but if you really want to know, in fact, Dibiji did a book on mantras. I think she covered maybe all or very close to all of the mantras that Yogiji gave. They're pretty much from Gurbani. They're pretty much from Guru Nanak and Guru Ram Das and Guru Gobind Singh. That's the story. The majority of the mantras are, are in Gurmukhi. The majority are, are taken from City Guru Granth Sahib and, you know, chosen for specific reasons. And it had to, has to do with the vibrational frequency that those sounds make. There were some um, Sanskrit mantras that he would teach, like Vayanti, for example. Um, but the majority of them were taken from Gurmukhi, from the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib. But the whole purpose of a mantra is to create a vibrational frequency. And those mantras were <clears throat> the vibrational frequency created by the mantras that he associated with the different uh, Kriyas was to you know, create a vibrational frequency that that gets channeled through whatever the posture is for maximum effect. And there's a tradition in that. So, it, I mean, we credit Yogi Ji with a lot, as we should, um, but he didn't just make that up. If you go to mm -hmm. a, a Gurdwara, there are books which have um, selections from the Gurbani. And uh, they say, well, if you're depressed, you can recite this. If you have difficulty in relationships, you can recite this. If you want to start a business, when I started the business, I, I recited Basant Kivar. We did okay. So that's, that's not a, something that he cooked up. Uh, that, is, um, that is a tradition. People know that certain mantras have different effects. Um, All right. And, you know, the core teaching, I mean, he was so um, radical. And we so wanted a radical teacher when he came. You know, his core teaching is satna, and um, I, I'm a kind of a bulldog. I don't like um, um, superficial answers uh, to questions. And uh, I had to study what satna really means. They say, oh, God's name, it means true name, it means what? But, um, you know, satna is very, very profound. Nam is identity, right? Sat in Sanskrit means is. So understand. Either something is or something isn't. Yeah? And so satnam basically means be what you are. Now, as a typical, say, North American, say, yeah, you know, put your feet up, relax, be yourself, have a beer. But um, that's not what it is. That's not really just being relaxed. No. It, it, you know, a three year old is very good at this. A three year old is very authentic. And after that, I joke, you know, life is downhill. We become adulterated. But, um, there's an interesting uh, psychological study. Um, uh, Ryan and Daisy, they, um, they talk about, it's a fairly new concept, you know, uh, came out about the late 90s, of intrinsic motivation. It means when you do something, just because, just because you feel, you know, this is what you want to do. Now, a three-year-old is full of that. As we age, then uh, we have... Uh, we, we balance our what we want to do with what society expects. And sometimes also we feel threatened, you know, if we don't do so and so. So, you know, you may say, well, I really want to, I'd rather be sailing, but uh, I have a wife and children to support. So I'll, uh, I'll do this job, which I don't like so much. But the end result is my wife and children are looked after and then I'll go sailing. So we, we make these trade-offs. Or sometimes maybe if you're a slave, you say, well, I'll do the job. Otherwise I get killed, you know, so... So, but intrinsic motivation is when you just do something out from your heart. Now, no paper has been yet written on intrinsic, not motivation, intrinsic being. Intrinsic being means being essentially who and what you are, being your true self. 
And it's probably a good thing because there's no methodology until yogis became, you, nobody's articulated the methodology for being satnam, which is just what Guru Nanak gave us. You know, Amrita Vela, get up early, focus on your true essence. Amrita Vela, touch an hour, what do you, in the early hours of the morning when there's nothing going on, there's no distractions, turn off your phone, please. You know, um, just be with yourself and meditate on who the hell are you? You know, what are you really? Are you just dancing around making other people happy? There's a beautiful book out of Australia. It's called The Five Top Regrets of the Dying. And the number one regret people had, they were eaten up with it, gave them cancer or some horrible disease. The number one regret is not living their truth. You know, just, just pleasing everybody else, but not living to your destiny, not living your dream. And Satnam, Yogi Ji was so in love with that and so that's a great teacher of that. And even if you know historically, the great early, early, early historian, the first historian of the Sikh culture, um, said, you know what Guru Nanak gave? This is, this is the beginning of his description of Guru Nanak's mission. Guru Nanak gave the world satna. And then he went on for many, many pages. But the first thing, he gave people how to be yourself. <laughs> and as hippies, with our minds kind of, you know, way opened up, we said, we love that. We want to do that. Only a lot of hippies didn't like the discipline, which is hard. But that's the mission, to be, be what you are, be what you were born to be, and don't live with regrets, don't live with a long face, don't be one of those adults, you know. Be, be a child. Jesus taught that too, you know. Unless you be as a child, you're not going any place. You're going the other place, you know. And that's totally, and Yoga Ji was so childish at times too. He could be so playful. Um, he was just fun. Or he could, you know, he could be whatever was, he was man of all seasons. He could be whatever was required. But at heart, there was a twinkle in his eye. And uh, he was beautiful. We loved him for that. He was a kindred spirit. He was one of us. He was twice our age or more. But uh, we, we loved him for that. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's the essence of what he thought. And then he gave it, you know, in yoga, and most people are not that really, Deep reading the Patanjali, but I found something one day that really made a lot of sense. Patanjali said that yoga has three pillars. And uh, the first pillar is tapasya. Now, Yogaji didn't teach theory, yoga theory so much, but you knew that he was teaching tapasya. Tapasya means out of your comfort zone, get out of your comfort zone. In other words, no self growth happens until you get challenged or you are challenged or you challenge yourself. You're really um, blessed. You will seek a teacher who will push you out of your comfort zone and not let you rest. But the first pillar of yoga is tapasya. The first pillar of yoga is do what's uncomfortable. first pillar of yoga is do the meditation when it's not fun to do anymore. Do the meditation early in the morning. Do the meditation in Florida, winter solstice when it's zero. Um, you know, do the meditation in your sadhana room and Half the people just had beans and they're farting. You know, do the med. Yogi Ji would say too, serving the undeserving is tapasya. It's good for you. And so that's the first place he took us, tapasya. Again, and, and not everybody liked it. They wanted, you know, the easy yoga. Somebody once said to Yogi Ji, I want one of those uh, loving teachers, you know. <laughs> he, he loved us too much to just let us sit around. Uh, he pushed us. And that's the first pillar. I call it the first pillar of life, really, because yoga is nothing but living a, a life and living it to its fullness. The second, the second pillar, then, is self-study. Second pillar. So study yourself under pressure and study yourself, or your mind, let's say. Study your mind, your body. Study your metabolism when you're under pressure. Study when you're not under pressure and work it out so that there's not such a split between the two of them. And you can have consistency, equanimity, as Yogaji would say, as Guru Nanak said, as is on Yogaji's tombstone, Ketiya Duk Buksadma Abhida Terida Ta. You know, whatever hardship comes, these also are blessings that we can be thankful for. That's the attitude of a yogi. And that's two pillars, right? The third pillar is um, plug yourself in, you know, study yourself really well so you know your strengths, and even you know your strengths that are coming up that aren't quite blossomed, and then study the world. Study the world, study its needs, study the pain in the world, and somehow find where your particular plug, you know, plugs don't go into every socket so well. Find the place where your plug goes and makes the biggest 
and most impactful, most meaningful difference, where you relieve, alleviate the most pain, create the most joy, the most um, upliftment. And that, that then is a life. That is a life well lived. A life of a sadhana, we can say sadhana is tapasya, a life of self-reflection, meditation, and a life of service and sacrifice. And, you know, if, if it kills you, you know, if the last thing you do is serve somebody, uh, you know, save their life, then that's a good memory. That's a good way to go out. There's no fear in this. Satnam, um, it's uh, after 2 a.m. for me. So I'm going to need to pull the plug. Thank you. God, God bless, bless you. you all. Thank Satnam. you so much. Sweet dreams. Satnam. May you find the you in you and fall in love with that you. <laughs> Satnam. Satnam. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. very precious. I, I think Gurtezi told me a while ago that he won't be able to attend on Tuesday. Um, we'll see if we can get another speaker, but I'll, I'll go on for a bit. I'm uh, reading your question. If you have questions, please put it in the chat and I'll pick it up once you run out of questions and um, I'll, I'll, and I've finished my little talk here. Uh, I'll say we're pretty much done. Um, so please do put up your questions if you have questions. So we talked about uh, Philip. In fact, the, the whole point of doing this was I, I felt for some time, and I've communicated to a number of people, including the head of KRI, that um, we are in this um, situation with a lot of allegations, partly because we haven't been telling our story. And uh, we need to tell our story. And when I came to know that Philip was uh, doing a webinar on tomorrow, uh, and I found out just last Monday, I said, God, you know, can't we just can't we do our own um, storytelling instead of just hearing other people's negative stories? Surely there's some things we can say as well. And so that's why we put together uh, before and after. Some of you may be going to the Sleeps uh, uh, webinar. I, I'm not discouraging you. It's going to be a little different. We're going to have some Yogi Bhajan haters there. And, um, but uh, I, I did want to uh, present a critique for any of you who's going there or just generally to say a good word and to hear uh, um, what Gurtesh Singh or any speaker we could find uh, could say. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, that's the point. I wanted to have this opportunity to say that everything some people that is recorded, it's gonna be recorded, God willing the technology works and you can uh, revisit and you can, you can share as well. Um, so yeah, I, as you, some of you may know, Yogiji gave me the job to write his biography. That in itself was a tapasya. He gives me the job in 83. I'm uh, uh, just barely making ends meet. And then I have a beautiful uh, son to look after. That was a priority of my life for the next seven years. And then I really felt called to, um, to look ahead to not just my son, but to um, future generations. And uh, I really wanted to uh, understand while Yogiji was still alive, uh, his teaching, his legacy, the context. And um, first I wanted to write his biography but care, I just wouldn't publish it. <laughs> it, um, it just uh, sat with them. And Yogiji may very well have known that. I mean, to, it, it really put me through some change. I, at first I thought, oh, I'm gonna publish a book, make a lot of money, I'll be famous. But that, that wasn't what was gonna happen at all. You sit and you sit. And um, so I ended up writing, uh, filling the time, uh, writing more. And in fact, I, for much of that time, I lived in Gurdwaras where I was very, I'm very grateful they fed me and they housed me. And I taught no yoga classes for a few years. I just focused on doing really intense research. And uh, I feel very blessed by those Sangats at the Gurdwaras who uh, took care of me and put up with me. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, uh, part of the story that I wrote while I was waiting for permission. I, I studied, first of all, um, you know, because Yogiji was such an exceptional Sikh. He taught us the great stories of Baba Deep Singh, uh, which is another one of those tales that scientifically doesn't add up, but we love it. We love the story of the crucifixion. We love the story of uh, the Panch Piyari who gave their head. Um, but I, I, I looked around me. I didn't see any, any really, really impressive uh, Sikhs. And so when I was given a ticket to India by uh, the London Gurdwara in London, Ontario, um, I spent some of my time there, a lot of my time, you know, studying, studying what, 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 what's the difference between now and the classical time of uh, Guru Gobind Singh? 
And uh, I wrote a piece which I sent to Gur actually I sent to Yogiji and um, Gurtel Singh, who I didn't know, uh, gave me the feedback. He said, Yogiji read, normally Yogi doesn't read books, doesn't read books, but I think maybe Gurtel read parts of it to him and Gurtel said, yeah, Yogiji liked the book. It was a critique, it was a, no, it was a study of uh, Sikhs under, mostly under the British and how the British colonized and belittled uh, and shamed the Sikhs to become, you know, good colonials, easy to rule. And um, it's, a, it's a hard book, but there are some, some heroes in it as well. So I call that Badges of Bondage. Badges of Bondage. It's not in digital form. That's a story why it's not in digital. But anyway, it exists. And it was a good education for me to, a good background for me to better appreciate Yogaji and where he came from, because he was born under the British. He was born a colonial subject and somehow rose, very much rose out of that domain. Um, then still having time and still waiting for approval from the KRI, I, um, I set to write a book on Punjabi. Now, um, if I'm to critique our nation, our family, um, in the light of Yogaji's teachings, I would say there are two things that um, really from early on we uh, fell short. And one is he really encouraged us to be 10 times greater than him, to do sadhana, vigorous sadhana on a daily basis. Most of us don't take that seriously. We say, oh, that's a mythology 10 times greater. God knows what my legacy is going to be, but I'm still working on that. You know, I'm still working on it. And God knows, maybe one day his dream will come true. It's not for my glory, but it's for his glory. That's the mission he set out. And um, I'm still his student, and that's, um, I would love to do that. Um, what form that takes, God only knows. And certainly not with an inflated ego. That's not going to do the job. But um, so for heaven's sake, let's maybe our second or third generation, we can start to seriously do our sadhana and not fail in our sadhana and push our boundaries. You know, the Aquarian sadhana expired, by the way. Uh, if anybody's paying attention, 2012. I did a video about it. You can find it on my uh, website or my video channel. I mean, it's expired. We're beyond that Aquarian sadhana. Uh, it's time for doing, I think, harder stuff. So that's my one critique. The other critique is early on, Yogiji told us, learn Punjabi. It'll help you to understand the mantras, help you to with your relationship with the Guru Granth Sahib, the Shabbat Guru. And you know what? There's also a huge family of people who are very prepared to love you and embrace you and support you if you just talk their language. Now, I know that as uh, Westerners, um, hey, I know this really well. My parents are German, right? And I was, to I was told I was superior age. Um, we're racist, you know? And everybody has that in them. Doesn't matter even if you're Indian, you know, if you're Chinese. Uh, we have cultural prejudices. But he really encouraged us to learn Punjabi. And by the Singh, we spoke of earlier, was really a role model in that. Um, we don't have that many role models in that. So. This is the critique I have to give you. Um, I speak some Punjabi and I have to tell you my one, well, I gave one uh, class in Punjabi in, in India when I was there. And it is one of the highlights of my life. You know, um, that a, a Gora, that a, a white guy should humble himself to learn a brown language and to teach in that. It, people do get that. And, uh, you know, I take example from the Sikhs of Montreal. You know, they come, they speak Punjabi, and they do speak Urdu, Hindi, and they in Montreal we have to learn English and French. And if they can, if they can do that, what the hell is wrong with uh, us that we can't learn just a little Punjabi? Hello, how are you? You know. So, um, so that uh, is uh, one of the critiques that I'm offering you. And and the second book that I wrote was called the Punjabi. I know the Punjabi Primer. Um, and uh, very simple, you know, there's words we speak in English that just come from, from Punjabi and uh, uh, words like uh, uh, veranda and, and uh, candle originally come from, from Sanskrit, come from Punjabi. And after that, I did um, a book, on, it's called The Essential Gursik Yogi. Again, even in, you know, in 3HO, some people, they focus on the Gurdwara, they dress up really good. And uh, some people, they focus on... Uh, do yoga, but they don't want to go to Gurdwara. Yogiji was a, a Gursik yogi. And uh, there's a whole book. Oh gosh. I'm not doing book sales. You can download this for free. You know, this is the book, Essential Gursik Yogi, 
It's a PDF. You can take it for free. It's a detailed study, which I was really happy to give Yogi Ji before he passed uh, to show that I got it and that we can get it. And uh, it's, it's richly filled with the only Gurbani and the history of, you know, the old history of the Sikhs, but also with Yogi Ji's uh, talks. And, um, and the third study I did was um, a study, because I was still waiting, you know, so I did um, a study of um, uh, the last 800 years, you know, dawning Aquarian age. Yogi Ji was, you know, there's no point in putting him on a pedestal, but he served a very valuable mission. And he did it in a, in a very articulate and a very uh, effective way to give us an age of inspiration, an age of brotherhood and sisterhood, an age of holism, uh, an age where God is, Leonard Cohen, the Canadian poet, would say, God is a lion, magic is a foot. And, you, and we recognize that. Quantum physics is very about that. Um, healing, uh, everything is magical. It's everything. And we should be in awe. The mantra for awe basically is, why, Guru? <laughs> why not? You know? But Yogi Ji would describe our journey as being from Satna, which is being authentic to Wahi Guru, which is experience of awe and seeing yourself in everybody. You know, if you can't see God in all, you can't see God at all. And um, so I wrote this massive book and, um, you know, whatever care I did right, they really didn't publicize this. There's no organization in New Mexico that really got a handle on this. Pick it up. It's another PDF. You can download it. Doesn't cost you a penny. You know, I don't mind. I did it for free. I did it for the pleasure. I did it for yoga Ji's service. But there's a, it's a very, very deep uh, study of how our whole culture um, has transformed itself. Uh, uh, there's a chronology there about 300 events from the year 1200. You won't believe. You may call me obsessive compulsive. I mean, I just had a lot of dream. And there's the anthropology, there's the history of what we do with our hair, there's a history of uh, uh, the body and you know, all the weird things we've done with the body. Our, our teaching is. As hippies, I'll admit, you know, since I was 14, I never wanted a haircut. It's made sense because Socrates, Plato, you know, a lot of people I respected kept their hair. I was never a Sikh at that time, but it just makes so much sense. Treat your body as a temple. And guess what? You'll find there's a God inside. Treat your body as a shit house. Guess what you're going to find inside, you know? So that's an integral part of what Yogi taught and what a lot of us knew intuitively before he arrived. We didn't. There's a Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young song, Almost Cut My Hair. Was, that was called our, our freak flag. Our hair was our flag. Our flag of distinction. Our flag that we're not going to knuckle under and become a slave to the military industrial state. You're going to be original. You know? And so, so that book was written. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, I did trauma work. With, I was very lucky with... Uh, a uh, student of mine, who's now a friend, Dr. Farah Jindani, he published uh, three papers, three scientific, uh, published, you know, uh, peer-reviewed papers on uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and how Kundalini Yoga can affect that. And uh, that's one reason I'm not going so much into you know, the allegations. We're certainly not going to belittle anybody's allegations because that's not helpful. You know, let the olive branch do their job. Uh, I mean, Ritesh Singh was much closer than Yogaji that I was from Toronto. I shouldn't sure see any hanky panky, but let let the olive branch do their work. Um, it's um, you may have heard of uh, Guru Tirith Singh's critique. It's a, it's a good critique because um, when you are allegations, typically there's a, a, a legal process involved and there's a cross examination and. Um, that's the legal process. That's where you find guilty or innocent. And it's not the therapeutic process that the olive branch people are taking on. So um, some people may not find much satisfaction in the olive branch uh, process. Um, I think uh, Gurtier's critique is, is valuable and valid. But um, uh, PTSD, it's a, it's a, who, who, there's so much PTSD in this world. And Kundalini Yoga, as taught by Yogi Bhajan, is just it's another uh, amazing uh, tool for the world, for the world. And, um, you know, I wrote, I'm not, I'm not um, somebody who shuns people. I do write uh, Sardarni Premkakar, no, Pat Dyson. Occasionally she helped me with the biography. There's some 
facts I didn't know that I couldn't get from anywhere else. And she helped me with writing the biography. But I also wrote her, my last email, I said to her, you know, congratulations on your book. Um, I just want you to know one thing that, um, and I know this from my <laughs> interactions on Facebook forums. Um, it's, it's brought up a lot of stuff. And there are a lot of traumatized people now who see uh, Yogi Bhajan as a boogeyman. And, uh, and uh, they must be traumatized to think that uh, the father, uh, the originator of a body of highly, um, very helpful uh, therapy is supposedly now a, a monster. And that's the narrative she's put out. And I told her, you know, please be aware of this and, and just know that uh, there's a problem in this, that there are a lot of people, especially women with PTSD, um, and this yoga can help. But stigmatizing, labeling the originator of yoga as a sexual monster uh, creates problems in itself. I'm not negating the story, but um, you know that's a fact I wanted to know. She didn't really appreciate knowing that, but um, so it goes. I think we'll just continue in our correspondence. Um, so have I said all, the book is, is out. Um, it's available now. I think most of you have received it. If you haven't, you can email me. Um, you can study the stories we know. And I'm still gathering stories. There's some beautiful, I mean, he told so many stories and I just took some notes from Drutej's uh, talk. Um, I plan to include those in the next PDF. Um, it's a very in inspiring story. Um, even if it's just a story, you know, we say, the Sufi standard, you know, if it inspires you, it's true. <laughs> so by that standard, I love it. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say. Like, like Gertez, I'm very grateful. You know, Gertez and I have survived. I can tell you one of our secrets of success is we, we're very blessed to um, have a discipline. You know, they're taking through us, us through thick and thin. You know, he's lost a child. Um, uh, I can't say my, my trauma is even really close to that, but uh, you know, sadhana aradhana prabhupati, that's my mantra too. And um, so I don't see any more questions. If you uh, want, you can email me them. Um, some of you are coming back on Tuesday. Uh, some of you are going to Philip de Sleep's um, uh, webinar tomorrow. I, I wish you much success. I hope it goes well. And um, I thank you all. May, shall we sing a long time, son? I won't be able to hear you, but we, let's sing wherever we are. I know we're, we're in a lot of different countries. May the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure life within you guide your way on. May the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure life within you guide your way on. Guide your way on, guide your way on. Sana. Thank you, Creator, for this legacy, for this teaching, for this life. Thank you for this webinar, Nar, and keeping all the technology going. Thank you for bringing us all here. Thank you for the Tej. Thank you for these memories. May we be blessed and blessed. May we be the lighthouse for this coming age by your grace. May you stay healthy. Thank you all. Um, next webinar is Tuesday. There's room there. Uh, you can sign on. I honestly can't tell you what to expect. As I say, Gutierrez doesn't expect to join us. That was a surprise. Um, but I do have another person uh, who has great stories, who I've asked to come, and she hasn't said she's not coming. Um, so <laughs> we'll go with the flow. Um, you can check it out. Uh, I, perhaps I can send you a, uh, if you're registered for Tuesday, I can send you an email and let you know any news. Um, God bless you. God be with you. And thank you so very much. We uh, should get the recording tomorrow and we will be sharing that as, as, as we know how. It's new technology for me, but um, we'll always do our best. Thank you so much. Satnam.